of Dromore released a statement saying one of their priests was under investigation for a safeguarding allegation of an historic nature. The priest himself released a statement on Sunday. That priest is Canon Francis Brown. The Nolan Show's investigative journalism team has been researching this story for the last couple of months. And we can reveal today significant details which are not in the public domain. Firstly, we can tell you that the police investigation is regarding a very serious historic allegation of sexual assault against a child while Canon Brown was at St Coleman's College, Newry. The Nolan Show has spoken to the alleged victim. Canon Brown vehemently denies any wrongdoing whatsoever. But what we want to concentrate on today are questions as to whether the Diocese of Dromore has breached its own child safeguarding protocols in this case and whether the Diocese and Canon Francis Brown's public statements on this matter give a full picture of how they reacted to the allegation. Let's start with Canon Brown. He said in his public statement that after he heard about the allegation, quote, Naturally, I have agreed, therefore, to step aside. The Nolan Show can reveal that what he's not telling you is that a member of the public confronted him about the allegation at the beginning of March. That member of the public then went back to him, went back to Canon Brown at the end of March and asked him if he had reported the allegations. He said he was refusing to do so. He said, I have nothing to report and said that it was up to the member of the public to report the matter. So in a statement, Canon Brown says the complaint was made recently and naturally stood down. And we just think it's important that you know that the allegation was brought to him over two months ago now. Next, the Nolan Show has important information to reveal as to how the Diocese of Dromore reacted to these allegations. Again, let's look at their public statement, which they released on Saturday night. It reads, quote, While this allegation is being investigated and as part of the diocesan safeguarding procedures, the priest has voluntarily stepped aside from all public ministry pending the outcome of the investigation. Here's what they're not telling you in the statement. Their reference to a safeguarding allegation of an historic nature is actually an historic allegation of a very serious sexual assault against a child. Secondly, the Diocese of Dromore is not telling you that the safeguarding officer knew about this allegation for at least a month before they formally spoke to Canon Brown about it. Now, the Catholic Church has publicly promised gold standard behaviour when they become aware of allegations about child abuse within their church. So why would their safeguarding officer not immediately ask Canon Brown about the allegation once they became aware of it? Why on earth would they not want to hear his side of the story quickly? Why would the diocese uh, not want to hear from the priest himself as to whether he was denying the allegations or other words? Why would they not want to ask if he was willing to immediately restrict his own duties? Instead, they went nowhere near him about these allegations for weeks. Now, the Catholic Church knew about the allegations against Canon Brown when they allowed him to celebrate Mass with school groups over Easter. So the key question is this. If the Catholic Church is now saying it's right that Canon Brown stood down because of these allegations, why was he allowed to do all of this? Remember, we know the church knew there was an allegation about Canon Brown from early March. And the Nolan Show knows they reported it to the police at this stage. So why has the announcement only come in the middle of May that he's standing down? There's more. It is our third revelation this morning that may shock many members of the community. The Catholic Church has made promises throughout the world that they have strict child safeguarding procedures in place. The Nolan Show can reveal to you today that when a member of the public approached a member of the diocese to make a complaint of child sex abuse, they failed 
to record the name of the person making the complaint or even a contact number or any details of the abuse. And that meant they had very little to give the PSNI. What on earth is the point of a member of the public trusting the church with an allegation if the basic details are not even asked for and therefore very little is written down? Now, the Diocese of Tremor say they did record the fact that the allegation was made against Canon Brown and passed that on to the PSNI and social services the next day. But because they didn't ask for the details, they couldn't tell the police anything about the alleged victim or indeed anything about the person making the complaint. The first time the police knew about the alleged victim was when we, the Nolan Show, passed on the details to the police with the alleged victim's consent. Now remember, we are aware of one allegation that has been made about Canon Brown, and he's an innocent man until and unless a court determines otherwise. Let me stress again, this is not about the veracity of the allegation. But to summarise what we are bringing to you today, what we are putting into the public domain this morning, we are stating as facts this morning that this priest refused to refer himself to his church, that despite their public promises, a member of the diocese didn't even record basic details about a child sex abuse allegation, which leads us to this sole question. Can the Diocese of Tremor, even to this day, be trusted to handle allegations properly and safely? And I know I've, uh, we've brought you a lot of information this morning, but there is one final point. After the church released the statement last weekend, and right up to now, the time of broadcast, Canon Brown is still named online as the youth ministry contact. Canon Brown is still chair of the Board of Governors at St Joseph's Boys School in Newry and is still the chairman of St Clair's Abbey Board of Governors where he's responsible for ensuring that child protection procedures are in place. Now the commentator uh, Martin O'Brien uh, with us this morning, I know this is a lot to take in uh, Martin, but what's your initial reaction? Good morning. Good morning, uh, Stephen. Um, first of all, I must say I'm not a child safeguarding expert, and uh, I think uh, your program would benefit from having a child safeguarding expert on the program. However, it seems to me that uh, there are two issues to be made. Number one, or two questions, or, or, or two points to be made. Uh, I. I, I I wonder about uh, the whole issue of process and uh, you're reporting that an allegation was made by a member of the public. Um, now, uh, the uh, procedure is that where there is a suspicion or a concern or uh, any suggestion that uh, something untoward has happened, somebody has been harmed, that that report is made to the designated liaison person. Now, the person to whom the complaint was made, uh, do we know who that person uh, is? The Nolan Show does know who uh, that, that person, person is. Is it the cleaner? Is it the janitor? No. Is it the parish priest? No, no. So is, it, then, is it a so, member of so, the parish council? Hold on, Martin. So what we do know and what we can report is that, that the allegation was brought to a priest within the Diocese of Dromor and that priest did not ask for any contact details, did not ask for any details, which meant that the church could go back to that person and, 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 and try to gather more information. So they asked nothing with the result that when, when the child safeguarding officer then got the information, the only thing they could do was go to the PSNI and say, we, someone came to us with an allegation against Canon Brown. They, 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 uh, so they didn't ask for a contact number. They didn't ask for the person's name who was reporting it. They asked nothing. OK. Well, uh, it would appear, as you relate that, that uh, the priest, once he was satisfied that there was a, a credible allegation, an allegation that uh, ought to be taken seriously, that it wasn't a frivolous allegation, 
should have gone to the uh, designated uh, liaison person yeah. uh, immediately. Let me, now, bring, let me bring Jim Gamble also into this, Martin, and yeah. you can both speak to us together because Jim is a child protection expert. Uh, Jim, I, I, I know you're just joining us this morning, uh, but, but here we have a situation, and, and there's a lot in this, but here we have a situation where someone trusts the church. They go to the church. They say, we want to make an allegation. And the priest turns around to them, doesn't even ask for a contact number, doesn't doesn't ask for more details. Well, I think the, the first thing is, of course, when people make allegations, regardless of who they make them to, and um, we've got to bear in mind that people are innocent until proven guilty. When it comes to safeguarding children, however, there's a requirement with regard to transparency. And any good policy in any safeguarding environment would say that it's not the responsibility of the individual to make a judgment as to whether or not the allegations are credible or true. It is the duty of the individual to pass them to the designated safeguarding lead, to the designated person who has the training and the contacts to share that information appropriately so that the right action can be taken to establish just those type of judgments so I don't think it's the, it's the role of anyone, be they a priest, be they a police officer, receiving a complaint or indeed a social worker uh, in, the, in the first instance to make a judgment about whether it's right or wrong. It's about capturing the information. Which, they didn't, so which he didn't other, do, which this priest did not do. And, and we'd need to look at the, the, more at the detail around that. I, I don't want to make judgments about an individual and I don't know the full facts, but I would expect that given what we have learned uh, over the past number of years through the, the number of safeguarding reviews where we've seen failures in institutions, you know, beyond the church, care homes, schools and, and, and elsewhere, that the heightened level of awareness would mean that most organisations have reviewed and refreshed their policy. They've increased training so that those who are coming into contact with the public know what to do, know what pathways there are to escalate concerns. So it, it's much more difficult now um, to kind of say, well, that was then and people didn't know. When people do know now that you need to escalate these concerns and they need to be escalated to people with the right training and with the right connections to ensure that the person making the allegation is treated credibly and with respect. And, in fact, when it's an allegation against a professional, and, and there are procedures when there's allegations against a professional, that that uh, professional is themselves treated with respect but removed from a situation until the investigation is complete whereby they could be seen to have an adverse influence over it or retain direct contact with children during it. Yeah, we, we, we also understand, Jim, that the Nolan Show understands that it was a month before the, the, the safeguarding officer for the Diocese of Dromor, that's Pat Carvel, formally spoke to Canon Brown about the allegation. Well, if, if Pat, as I understand it, passed the information at the minute it was received to the police, um, I, I think that's more understandable, you know, waiting for perhaps direction from the police or from um, the, the local safeguarding community. I don't know whether or not in Northern Ireland they take advice from the safeguarding board, but certainly uh, in, in England, where I chair three boards, an allegation of that nature would go to a local authority designated officer, so immediately be brought outside of the control of the organisation against where the professional works. And then meetings would be had to decide the best uh, course, i.e. do we suspend, uh, do we give the person the opportunity to step back, uh, ultimately is it a criminal investigation, is it a misconduct investigation? Those decisions would be had outside. So I think to be fair to Pat, if they report, if, if, given that we're told that Pat reported immediately to police that was the right action. And whether or not then going to question a person who has now had an allegation made is the role of the designated person, I would query, I would say once that allegation is in, um, it's the decision to be made is whether they're suspended, whether they step back, but actually yeah. that everybody steps back and lets the police do their job. But we do know that the, that the church did eventually then seek permission to go to Canon Brown so, so the safeguarding officer, after a period of four weeks, then did seek to go and speak to Canon Brown, Martin O'Brien, about the allegations. Yes. Uh, I think that uh, th there's maybe a, a general observation to be made here about uh, the quality of training in safeguarding, particularly in a diocese like Dremore, uh, that has been... Serious questions have been raised, really, about its... Uh, 
functionality. You have to remember that all this was actually happening in the context of a diocese in uh, a state of crisis ever since the spotlight program at the middle of February. And uh, you, you had the situation then where uh, Bishop McAreevy uh, announced his resignation even though it had, it had not been accepted. The diocese was in a state of total uh, uh, crisis and uh, paralysis. And uh, that really uh, continued for uh, three weeks until uh, the Pope, on advice, stepped in and appointed uh, Bishop Boyce as the uh, apostolic uh, administrator. You also, on top of that, you had the PSNI announcing their investigation right at that time too, at the end of March. So I imagine that this, this just has to be seen. It's not making any way any uh, excuses for a breach of procedures or anything like that, but uh, it is impossible to overstate the level of crisis, the level of paralysis uh, that uh, existed in Dromore, and surely, Dromore is not out of the woods yet. But surely you could argue that, that given that level, as you describe it, of crisis, that the Diocese of Dromore would be even more particular about what are the procedures, are we following them? For, 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 example, yes, for, exam absolutely. for example, Jim Gamble, um, you know, right up until today, so what Canon Brown has said uh, in his statement is that he's agreed to set aside from his role as administrator of the parish to allow an investigation to be completed. So he's stepping aside. That's what his public statement is. And the Diocese of Dromore is concurring with that. Meanwhile, Canon Brown is still, to this day, if a young person looks up the internet, he is still the point of contact, contact for youth ministry at the Diocese of, of, of Dromore. His email is there. Now, well, well, that, now that it does, is, that, is that consistent with what should no. be happening? Well, no, that, that's simply a lack of attention to detail. I think somebody needs to, you know, remove that. that you know, the canon has said that, that he will step back during the investigation. Uh, that's appropriate. There should be nothing. Uh, then when he steps back, those duties should, uh, uh, in essence... Uh, be passed to someone else and that needs to be reflected so that young people who need pastoral care, need advice or help, have a point of contact and that they're not in fact being misdirected and clouding this investigation uh, or, but, or the circumstances but, around but it. But you say lack of attention to detail, Jim, but through the right of reply process, what that means is, you know, the Nolan Show will have contacted, and we did contact both Canon Brown and the diocese, asking them why the point of contact was still Canon Brown. Uh, and by the way, let me stress this time, it's really important we are not talking about the veracity of the allegation against Callum Brown. Callum Brown is an innocent man until or unless a court determines otherwise. And, and, and we need to let that investigation unfold to be fair to him and all parties involved in this. But we pointed this out to the, to the Diocese of Dromore. We said to them, why is he still the, the, the point of contact? And they, they just didn't address it. He is still, by the way, the point of contact. Uh, Jim Gamble, I'll put this point to you at Sinclair's uh, school, where he is, it, it, the, the flow chart says, if I am still concerned about a child's safety, the ultimate two people you go to is either Mrs. Siobhan Gorman, the, designed go the, the designated governor, or Canon Francis Brown. He is still right. the point of contact at Sinclair's. When we contact Sinclair's and we say to them, look, what should a parent do? Should they still go to, Sin to, to Canon Brown? They, they push us to the diocese. The diocese refused to answer the question. And, and so this comes down to policy and procedure and how that's carried out in practice. And that's why I'm saying this is an, a, a lack of, of experience, a lack of, of, of an eye for detail. The problem is we hide behind crisis. So we, we say, and it's true, there will be paralysis, there will be crisis, there will be anxiety. Some people will tilt towards protecting the reputation of the organisation as opposed to doing exactly what's right when an allegation is made uh, for the greater good of the, of the vulnerable. The problem here lies in the fact that actually they clearly don't have the right policies and practices in place because those policies and practices would guide and steer them, particularly in crisis. When you're in crisis, policy is more important. Crisis is no excuse not to follow the correct procedure. It's a time when you need to navigate a difficult situation like this by following policy. And I would assume, and maybe wrongly, that an organisation that has been through the trauma um, of this before, that has gone through 
uh, and learned hopefully many lessons from not dealing with it correctly in the past. But that organization has actually got its act together. The worrying thing here is that it doesn't seem uh, that that is, is the case. And that's not making a judgment about the veracity of the allegation. That's making a judgment about the policy that's in place, the procedure that's carried out, the training that reinforces it, and, and, and the outcomes whereby you have these these issues, which I understand are concerning, whereby an individual who stepped back from a particular role for very good reason is still being promoted on websites as being the person responsible for uh, sensitive engagement with children. That was Sinclair's Abbey Primary School I was talking about. Martin O'Brien, I'll come to you in just a second. Jim, I know you're pu- pushed for time. Um, finally, what's your, what's your view on uh, the other element of this, which we are reporting today, which is that we, we know that a member of the public went themselves, not just to a member of the dia- diocese to, to report this, this allegation, but they went to Canon Brown himself. And they went to him at the beginning of March. And then a few weeks later, they went to him again. And they asked him to make his diocese aware of the allegation against him. And he refused to do so. Now, what, 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 what is your view on that? My personal view and my professional view on that is that when an allegation about a professional is made directly to that professional, they must disclose that. Because if they don't, it certainly creates the impression with the gift of hindsight that either one, they were trying to minimise and trivialise it, or two, they didn't want it to come to light. If someone comes to you tomorrow and makes an allegation to say, look, I know you did this and you need to come forward and report it, Uh, Whether you did it or didn't, and let's say you didn't, you still have to go and and follow the the, the code to make to self-refer that that allegation is being made. Well, he he told the member of the of the of the public it was up to them to report it, and that he wouldn't do so. He was refusing to do so. And this comes down to a lack of training and a lack of understanding and a lack of proper process. When an allegation is made, particularly against a professional in a position of ultimate trust. That professional must self-refer that. They must self-refer it. Well, well, and, 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 and yet, Martin O'Brien, some people might understand what Canon Brown also t- told this member of the public at the time was that he hadn't abused anyone. So, so he, 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 maybe some people would understand why would he want to go to his authorities and disclose something which it is his position he didn't do. Well, he should for the reasons that uh, Jim Gamble uh, spelled out there a moment ago. And I would have thought, uh, Stephen, that uh, uh, Bishop Boyce, if he hasn't done it already, should be uh, requesting the National Board for Safeguarding Children to go come back to Dromore and carry out a root and branch uh, audit of their uh, procedures, of their practices, uh, to uh, ascertain just how ship they are in regard to uh, safeguarding uh, procedures. There's, 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 there's also uh, an issue of, of public confidence this morning, insofar as we are asking questions in the public interest, uh, some of which are really obvious. So I told you about St Clair's Abbey Primary School. Does a parent still go to Canon Brown or not if they have a, a, a concern about any issue of child safety within that school? Well, the school won't tell be, us. Sorry, Stephen, but clearly he should not uh, be in that position. And of course, he really is not in that position. The website hasn't caught up with the reality. The fact of the matter no, is... No, that's not just a website. The, 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 the point is that the school are refusing to tell us uh, whether Canon Brown should or shouldn't be contacted still about a child safety issue. The diocesans are, are refusing to tell us this is not an isolated incident because Canon Brown is, at this moment, uh, it is our understanding that he is still part, a member of the of St Joseph Boys High School in Newry, of their school safeguarding team. He's the chair of the Board of Governors there. We asked St Joseph's the same question. Does someone go to Canon Brown still as part of his role of the school safeguarding team? And St Joseph's won't tell us either. They pointed us to the diocese. The diocese won't tell us either. Well, you're highlighting there, of course, uh, a serious communications problem. There's a cultural issue there with so many organisations who basically uh, run scared of uh, the media, who do not see and appreciate, maybe for understandable reasons, but do not 
see and appreciate the legitimate role of the media in holding people in authority to account. One final question, Jim Gamble. Um, what we do now know is that, the, is that both the Diocese of Dromore and indeed Canon Brown last weekend issued this public statement essentially saying, look, because there was a police investigation, because there is a police investigation, Canon Brown is stepping aside and Canon Brown has said that he looks forward after that allegation is investigated by the police to returning to his ministry. But he's currently stepping aside. That's what he said this weekend. For, for those people who are wondering why then he still provided, presided over Easter services with, 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 with school groups at Easter after he knew about the allegations. The Diocese of Dromore knew about the allegations at that stage. Why was it okay for him to preside over the, 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 the Easter celebrations then, the Easter masses then, and yet he has stood aside now? What has changed? Well, the, the, the issue is this. We don't know the exact nature of the allegations that have been made against uh, this individual. It's a serious sexual abuse allegation. Uh, I, I, yeah, but, but we don't know the exact nature Which of the denies. circumstances, you know, and whether it was an, an abuse of trust uh, with regard to particular intimate access to individuals connected with the church or elsewhere. We don't know any of that. So uh, I, I agree with, with, you know, wholeheartedly with what the other speaker just said. I think this is about the trauma, the anxiety and the crisis uh, that, that happens in the aftermath of something like this and people make mistakes. When someone steps back, they step back. Um, and then that should be communicated to everyone and it should be reflected, in my opinion, in their duties being restricted over that period. The fact of, of delivering a, a service during Mass, um, my, my personal view would have been that that was unwise, but I am not sure what their policy and procedure say, nor am I sure of the exact nature of the allegation and whether or not there was a risk assessment I think it's, carried I, out. I think, I think it's a fair question, though, Jim, to, to ask what, ha, what has changed. What, what, why now? And why not then? Um, well, it's a fair question. And, and you know, you're, you're asking someone who doesn't have the answer. So, you know, if we want to be wholly critical, of course we can do that. It's easy to do in these circumstances. Um, I feel for the schools, I feel for those associated with this, because the vast majority of people are decent people doing difficult job in, in what are now even more trying circumstances. And we don't get these things right all the time. The key is that we learn lessons okay. And, okay. And, and move forward. OK, and finally, Martin O'Brien, what advice would you give to the Diocese of Tremor this morning? Oh, I would advise them really to uh, professionalise, just in the sense, just to uh, uh, also to... Um, uh, to, 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 to I'd like them to... It, it, it may seem counterculture to pray, and I would just like them also as as uh, as Catholics, but I would also like them to say, "Look, to acknowledge, look, we have uh, a big problem here uh, to sort out. It will take time, and uh, we have to uh, address it though uh, with honesty, uh, okay. with with, uh, with transparency, and uh, with, with an openness to change." Okay, Martin O'Brien and Jim Gamble, thank you very much indeed. Well, obviously, there is a, a, a lot of information to bring in uh, this morning. Um, there, there is a statement. Our reporter, Nicola, New, uh, Nicola Weir, is in Newry uh, th this morning. And we have got a, a statement, Nicola, uh, from Pat Carvel, who is the Child Safeguarding Officer. And indeed, uh, this, this statement also reflects the view of the Diocese of Dromore. What does it say, Nicola? Yes, Stephen, I'm in Newry. I'm actually close to St Coleman's College this morning for you. And yes, we did get a statement in from Pat Carvel um, in response to those allegations. He's the safeguarding officer. Now, his statement reads, issues of safeguarding are taken very seriously in the Diocese of Dromore and as per our policies and the direction of the National Board of Safeguarding Children in the Catholic Church, we cooperate fully with the police and social services in regard to complaints, allegations and suspicions referred to the diocese. We are aware of an ongoing investigation, police investigation at this time, and we will not be in a position to comment on these matters until the police have completed their inquiries. We would ask that any information you have is passed on to the police as soon as possible to assist them in this investigation. 
Um, Stephen, we also have received a uh, new statement from Canon Francis Brown. And in that statement, which has been sent to us there in the last half hour... This, is from, says, his, this is from his solicitors uh, re representing uh, Canon Brown. It is indeed, and they have said, um, from Canon Brown, I have been informed by Bishop Philip Boyce for Nic the diocese. Nicola, let me, let, me, let, me, let me just interrupt you there, Nicola, because I've got the same statement ahead of me here, and I know you're, you're on the ground in Uri for us this morning. So what, what, what you're about to read here, first of all, is actually the, the statement, as a solicitor points out, that, that Canon Brown released... Um, uh, at, at the time, so in other words, at the weekend. So this is what he said, Nicola. Read it to us, please. Um, this is the latest statement now that has been sent to us, Stephen, um, and I'm reading it actually off uh, my emails here, so I've just recently received it. And in that statement it said, I've been informed by Bishop Philip Boyce uh, for the diocese that an allegation of an historic nature has been made against me. The details um, of that allegation have not so far been made known to either myself or the diocese. The complaint has been made recently and I understand that some time is required to have it investigated. I have agreed therefore to step aside from my role as administrator of the parish for the time being to allow the investigation to be completed. In accordance with the agreed protocol, I shall not be involved in ministry during that period of time. I wish to reassure all of my parishioners, my fellow priests and religious that I look forward to a thorough and expeditious examination of this matter and I expect to return to my work in the parish in the near future. And it ends, I hope that you will remember me in your thoughts and prayers in the weeks ahead and I look forward to returning soon to again serve you in the parish of Newry. And that is the full statement that we have just received. That, that's the statement that, that he released at the weekend. The statement then continues... Uh, to read, and this just came into the Nolan Show at nine o'clock this morning, about 35 minutes ago, uh, from his solicitor, and it continues to say, it says, Canon Brown categorically asserts that he has never at any time behaved inappropriately to any child or adult. Police have not asked to meet with Canon Brown, and if they do make such a, requ a request, he will cooperate fully with them in any investigation which they undertake. Now, if, if we just take time to think about uh, these statements that, that, that have now come into the Nolan Show, if we start off at the, at the core of our story, which is about the procedures then um, and, and, and how the diocese has handled this allegation, I, I should probably share with you then some of the questions which, the, which both Pat Carville, the Child Safeguarding Officer, and the diocese are not directly answering. So they are therefore not telling the public and refusing to answer as to whether Canon Brown reported to them that a member of the public had asked him to refer the allegation to them. Uh, the diocese and indeed Pat Carville uh, refusing to address that question that the BBC has put to them. Um, the, the Pat Carville and the diocese also then um, refusing to tell us uh, why Canon Brown is still published online as the point of contact for uh, youth ministry. They have, we've asked them if that is consistent with safeguarding protocols and the safeguarding officer is not prepared to tell us whether that is consistent with safeguarding protocols. On the issue of St. Clair's Abbey Primary School, um, we asked... I'll share with you the exact question we asked uh, both the safeguarding officer Pat Carville and the Diocese of Dromore. We asked why is Canon Brown still the most senior point of contact at St Clair's Abbey Primary School for parents with concerns about child safeguarding issues and the Diocese and Pat Carville refusing to answer that question. We also asked is Canon Francis Brown currently chair of the Board of Governors at St Joseph's Boys School? Is Canon Brown currently on the school's safeguarding team? If so, why? Both the Child Safeguarding Officer, Pat Carville, and the Diocese of Dromore refusing um, to answer that. They do say within their statement, we're aware of an ongoing police investigation and will not be in a position to comment on these matters until the police have completed their inquiries. And I'm just trying to think to myself, how on earth a police investigation would stop the Diocese of Dromore or indeed the Child Safeguarding Officer from telling us um, whether... 
uh, if a parent has a concern at a school, that they, who do they go to? How on earth does a police investigation stop that? With regards, with regards of the um, of the statement that has come into us at nine a.m. this morning from the solicitors uh, representing uh, Canon Brown, uh, some of the questions that we have asked that uh, Canon Brown uh, is not answering at this stage. We asked why he told a member of the public that he did not have to refer himself to the church when that person was was asking him to to do so. We asked him if he then did refer that to the reporting officer, Pat Carville, um, and we asked him if he had referred the allegations or discussed them in any way with any other member of the church and Canon Brown um, not uh, addressing those specific questions that the BBC uh, has put to them, uh, put to him. We need to stress again that this story today is not about the veracity of the allegation it is one allegation against Canon Brown. We need to stress that Canon Brown has said that he will cooperate fully uh, with the police investigation. We now also learn uh, from the solicitor's letter that's come into us within the last few minutes that the police have not approached uh, Canon Brown um, by this stage, at this stage. Um, but, but the clear story that we're doing today is not about uh, the veracity of the allegation it is about how does an institution react when an allegation is brought to them. And there will be further details uh, about this story if you want to read about it. They're, they're there now, actually, on the BBC website, uh, the BBC News NI uh, website. Let me also give you some details um, should you need them. Uh, 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 for, for example, victim supports number. Uh, 90 244039, Nexus 90 32 6803. There, there are a whole range of numbers uh, that if you do think that you need some help or, or assistance, you can find all of those numbers on the BBC website and we'll tweet those out as well from our Nolan Twitter feed. Okay, 20 uh, to 10 uh, is the time. Let's move on. Voters in the Republic will go to the polls on Friday to decide whether to reform Ireland's abortion laws. Currently, the Eighth Amendment recognises the rights of the mother and the rights of the unborn child as equal. A vote to repeal the Eighth would pave the way for new legislation governing abortion. Uh, our Dublin correspondent, Shane Harrison, uh, with us today. Good morning to you, Shane. Good morning, Stephen. How did this referendum... Let's go back to the start then, Shane. How did this referendum come about? Well, in 1983, four years after a papal visit, the people of the Republic put into a constitution the Eighth Amendment, which gives equal rights to life, to the mother and to the unborn, as, as far as is practical. But in the meantime, there have been a number of hard cases, and of course hard cases may make for bad law, but they also change public perceptions about abortion. In 1992, you have the X case. This is the 14-year-old schoolgirl, the victim of a statutory rape, who was initially prevented from leaving leaving Ireland for a British abortion. In the meantime, you've had cases like Savita Halapanavar, the Indian dentist, who was taken to hospital pregnant and ill. Uh, she called for an abortion as her health greatly deteriorated, but the medics didn't give her one. They say that it was because of the Eighth Amendment or that was a contributory factor. Uh, other doctors say no, she died of sepsis and the Eighth Amendment wasn't. But in any case, public perception about abortion changed. And there have been other cases since then. A woman kept alive on a life support system while pregnant, even though she was clinically dead. Her parents wanted the life support system turned off. Eventually it went to the courts and it was decided that at 16 weeks the fetus wouldn't be able to survive outside of the womb. There was the case as well of a, a woman who came to Ireland, a refugee, a victim coming from a war zone, a victim of a rape. She was suicidal. She obviously didn't have a passport or the documentation to go to Britain for an abortion, she ended up being forced into a caesarean section. All of those cases have changed public perceptions from 1983 about the issue of abortion. But on the other hand, it's important to stress that the no side, though.
want to keep the Eighth Amendment say that this is fundamentally a human rights issue, that in any pregnancy there are two rights, that of the mother and of the unborn. And if you repeal the Eighth Amendment, you're going to normalize abortion and it's going to increase Irish abortion rates, even though nine women leave the Republic every day for British abortions and four risk a 14-year jail term by importing pills via the internet without any medical supervision to induce the pregnancy termination. And where do the main parties stand on this, Shane? Um, they're divided, Stephen. Fine Gael, the main government party, is campaigning for a yes vote, but it's allowing its TDs and senators and party representatives to vote according to their conscience. And there are a number of their TDs who will vote no. Fianna Fáil's leader, Micheál Martin, Fianna Fáil, the main opposition party, he's also urging a yes vote, but the majority of his parliamentary party are going to vote no. Sinn Féin is urging a yes vote, but two of its TDs, Carol Nolan from Offaly and Padre Tobin from Meath, they're urging a no vote. Indeed, Padre Tobin was the main spokesman for the no side in the major TV debate on RTE television last night. The hard left TDs, the Trotskyite parties, they're all very much in favour of yes. And as you know from the Irish Parliament, the Doyle at the moment, there are a whole rake of independent TDs. They vary as to which side they take. Shane, thank you very much indeed. Ivana Batchik is a Labour uh, senator who is uh, with us uh, this morning. Ivana, good morning to you. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning, good morning. Well, th this is obviously um, a, a very emotive debate. Uh, we, people have very strong opinions on this. Ivana, what's yours? Well, you're right that it is a very uh, emotive debate and uh, certainly there's been a great deal of, of coverage, a great deal of discussion and so on. But I think, and I've, I should say I've been canvassing up and down the country um, uh, with the Together for Yes campaign, which is the National Civic Society campaign, and also with my own party, Labour, which is also calling for a yes vote and indeed opposed the original amendment in 1983. But I think over the 35 years since the amendment was inserted, as your correspondent Shane has said, there's been a whole series of tragic cases uh, in which women have been harmed by the Eighth Amendment, and indeed in the case of Savita, very tragically, a woman died. So uh, we really learnt, I think, just how much damage it can do. And I think we've also learnt that it doesn't stop women from travelling for abortion, nine or ten every day who travel to England, and now increasingly three or four women every day who are taking the abortion pill here in Ireland in circumstances where they have no access to medical support or supervision, and where of course it is a criminal offence for them to do so, so they're under threat of criminal sanction. And I think in all of, because of all of that, I think increasingly people are realising that the law is too restrictive and that we need to remove from the Constitution the absolute ban which, uh, uh, which currently prevents us as legislators from providing for any reform, even in cases where a woman or girl has been raped or is a victim of incest or where a pregnancy poses a risk to a woman's health or indeed in the devastating consequence of a, a, of a couple receiving a diagnosis that the chi a child won't be born alive, in other words, fatal fetal abnormality. So I think for all of those reasons, we're seeing a real increase in support for the yes. Having said that, Stephen, you know, there is a very uh, vocal no campaign also around the country with particularly graphic posters and imagery. And I think it will be a close result, but certainly we'll be campaigning very hard to seek to ensure that on Friday there is a yes vote. Well, I'm sure Bernie Smith from Precious Life will, will have a view on what you've just said. Good morning to you, Bernie. Good morning, Stephen. <clears throat> yes, Ireland has come a long way since 1983. We have world-class health service for women that cares for both. And I think to address what Ivana was saying there about the tragic case of Savita Halapanova, and I think it's very tragic that and disingenuous for anyone to use her case to advance um, legislation that would actually take the lives of, of unborn children, vulnerable unborn children. The actual outcome of that inquiry made very clear that in, uh, and I think it was, it was October 2013, that found that the medical team missed 13 opportunities to intervene and save her life. But the, the staff failed to locate the, the infection which led to her life. And it wasn't due to the fact that we have an, the Eighth Amendment that protects both mother and child. But the Eighth Amendment is a piece of legislation that ensures the protection and the most basic rights of both mother and child. And in 2013 also, 1,000 signatures um, were put to a document and it's called the Dublin Declaration of Medical Maternal Care. And it was very clear that these doctors um, affirmed that there's no medical need to intervene or to protect the life of the unborn child in order, to, in order to save the mother. So when we have something that works, why change it? Science tells us now that the baby in the womb is an individual 
unique individual human being. And um, Ireland being one of the highest ranking countries in the world where women are, have the status as one of the safest places in the world to protect the mother and the child. That doesn't need to be changed. Ivana? Well, I would say, first of all, that, of course, <clears throat> the law in Ireland, in our jurisdiction, is very different from that in Northern Ireland or indeed in England and Wales because in Ireland we have a written constitution and the Eighth Amendment is not a piece of legislation. It is, in fact, a constitutional text. It can only be changed by a referendum of the people. And that's really the difficulty we face, is that we cannot uh, amend it, it, we cannot uh, legislate to introduce abortion in even the most in even the most tragic of circumstances that I've outlined, such as rape or incest, without deleting from the Constitution the text that bars us from legislating. I should say in the case of the very tragic case of Savita Halapanova, her parents have publicly called this week for a yes vote because they recognise that the Irish law, the Eighth Amendment, was implicated in her death. And indeed, the leading British obstetrician who chaired the independent 